From Cross Culture Church in Raleigh, North Carolina, this is Crosswalk. Welcome to a brand new series here at Cross Culture Church entitled The I Am Series, Exploring the Mysteries of God. Over the next several weeks, Pastor Clay is going to walk us through some of the mysteries of God based on God's general revelation to us in His creation and His special revelation to us in the Bible, the Word of God. A good place to kick off this series is by examining the idea of God's very existence. But is there actually evidence and arguments for God's existence? As you'll hear Pastor Clay say in today's message, God is more than willing to reveal Himself to those who would seek to know Him. But proving Himself to men isn't God's intention. Having said that, though, it doesn't mean that there aren't evidences and arguments for God's existence for men to consider. So, we're going to start this series with a look at a few of the arguments for the existence of God. Now, here's Pastor Clay. Well, well, well. We've had several... uh technological glitches today we may we may not be done with those but uh but god's still worthy of worship right god can still be worshiped whether things run smoothly or don't run smoothly or whatever right and i want to say again it's just so good to be home we had such a great time but there is no place like home there really isn't now i, I really appreciate uh dr steve pierce now he was in here earlier did he disappear he went out? <clears throat> he didn't. I didn't tell him I was, but uh, I appreciate Dr. Steve Pierce uh, filling in for me both weeks that I was uh, gone, and uh, I haven't watched the messages yet, but I'm sure that he did a fantastic job. I'm, I'm sure that he did. But I'm also sure that, you know, Steve is a nice guy. I mean, he's just a nice guy. And so I'm afraid that there's always the possibility that perhaps Steve was a little too nice uh, to you guys. And so I think the next time uh, that I'm gone, uh, here, oh, here he comes. I'm just talking about you, Steve. Come on in here, brother. Uh, I, I was just saying that, um, that I'm sure you did a fabulous job while I was gone, but, but I'm also sure that you're such a nice guy that maybe you were a little too nice to these people. And so the next time I'm gone, I'm gonna, I, I think I'm going to have uh, this guy up on the video screen. I think I'm going to have him come in and uh, and preach to y'all hopefully we'll have the video and, and sound it'll work but i think i'm gonna bring this guy in son don't go to sleep while i'm talking hey 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 don't 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 you lay your head back I, i'm i'm important i'm somebody now you might do your english teacher that way but i'm not teaching english i'm teaching eternal life here i love you you know i love you have i convinced you i love you uh, yeah you better th- you better nod your head yes all right come on put it right there all right you stay awake and you listen to me you say, well, he may never come back. Well, he ain't here now. And where have you been, Mr. Underwood? And I noticed on the calendar I'm supposed to marry y'all. What makes you think I'd marry you? You're one of the sorriest church members I have. You're not worth 15 cents. And you want me to marry you to her? And you want to marry him? And he don't even know where he belongs? And you don't even know where you belong? Now, uh, let me tell y'all, everybody here, how much I love these kids. Do you know I love you, sir? Stand up, big boy. Do you know I love you? All right. All right. Give me a little love. Amen. I'm a real deal. Yeah. All right. I know you are, too. But you ain't been here. You can't get this in any other church in town. Now, y'all don't want me. All you got to do is tell me we won't have a church fight because I'll get my little Connie and we'll get in her little Buick Enclave. It's paid for. And we'll sell what we need to sell. And we'll go on down the road and we'll find some little podunk church that don't know up from down. And I'll find me a dozen Joe's baskets who don't have a pot or a window and who will shout Jesus. And I'll give the rest of my life to them. Y'all didn't know how good y'all had it, did you? Wow. <laughs> Pastor Jim, <laughs> kind of going off there. Now, I, uh, I mentioned Pastor Jim, or show you Pastor Jim, mentioned to you about Pastor Jim, <clears throat> because uh, one thing for sure, if you're, uh, and I have no idea where this church is, I'm sure you could research and find it, but, uh, but you don't want to go to sleep when that guy is, is preaching, right? I mean, you do not want to go to sleep when that guy... This preaching I was saying, and I mentioned that to you because 
in, in the course of uh, this morning's message, as quickly as I can go through it, but in the course of this morning's message, there may be a point uh, at, at some uh, time during the message where you may be, uh, find yourself vulnerable to uh, drifting off. And I don't want that uh, to happen uh, to you. Uh, we are starting a new series uh, today, kicking off a new series. We will break it next week. Is ne- next Sunday's Mother's Day, right? So next Sunday will be j- a special Mother's Day uh, uh, thing. All the kids are going to be in here for the service, and uh, men are doing some stuff for the ladies and all that kind of stuff. But uh, So we'll have a, a Mother's Day thing. But, but we're starting a new series today uh, entitled uh, The I Am Series, exploring... Uh, the mysteries of God, or at least some of the mysteries of God. And I'll be honest with you, especially for these first initial messages, this is, this is not my comfort zone, because I generally like to exegete a passage of text, uh, Scripture. I like to work through a passage of Scripture. And what we're doing, at least uh, today and in the, in the next couple, is may not necessarily allow for that in the way that I would choose to do it, but we're looking at some of the mysteries of God. Now, obviously, we can never fully explore uh, the depth of the mystery of God and all that God is, but I felt like that this would be a good time to perhaps at least begin to look at some of the things that, that quite honestly, we see, most of us would see as mysterious or, or uncertain about or unknown about. For instance, what is known as the doctrine of the Trinity. The idea that God is three and at the same time he is one. Now, I know that we can uh, probably not, well, as a matter of fact, I know we can't fully understand the, the depth of the doctrine of the, of the triune God, that God can be three and at the same time one. I know we cannot fully comprehend that, but I also know that having a, some type of understanding of it is absolutely essential for a solid a foundational relationship with God. You have to get this in your head, this idea about who this God is and how he is three persons and he is one Godhead. The existence of evil. Why does evil exist? Why does God allow evil to exist? Anybody ever wondered about that? Is there something kind of mysterious about that? How can God be loving and good, but at the same time, how can there be such bad stuff in the world? That may be one of the mysteries that we explore. What about salvation? Is it completely, totally uh, a work of God? Or does man have some accountability, some responsibility in his salvation? That could be an interesting study, right? So those are some of the of the mysteries that we may explore in the coming weeks. But I I thought it best to start this series. Are you all with me? All okay? All right. That seemed kind of quiet. Don't worry, you're going to get quieter. (laughs) I I thought that uh, perhaps the best place to start this series was to look at some of the uh, evidence or arguments for the existence of God. What are the evidences, what are the arguments for the very existence of God? You know, when, um, when, when God came to Moses in the wilderness and he told uh, Moses that he was going to send them to the Israelites to tell them that he was going to send him to Pharaoh, to tell Pharaoh to let them go, to bring them out of 400 years of slavery. When God uh, told Moses that in this burning bush uh, experience and Moses, you know, had his doubts and his apprehensions and all this kind of stuff. And at some point, Moses asked, "Well, let's just look at it in uh, Deuteronomy chapter three. Uh, then Moses said to God, "Behold, I'm going to the sons of Israel, and I will say to them, the God of your fathers has sent me to you. Now they may say to me, what is his name? What shall I say to them? If they ask me, who is who is this God you're saying that has sent you to us?" God said to Moses, I am who I am. And he said, thus you shall say to the sons of Israel, I am has sent me to you. The I am, the great 
I am. The word essentially means the self-existing one. He is the self-existing one. He is the one who has existed, does exist, and forever exists. He is the God without cause, and that'll come up here a little bit later. But this God, this mysterious God, this, this one that we refer to, who is he? What is he like? What does it mean? And are there arguments for his existence? Let's face it, let's be honest. We are living in a culture that every day is becoming more and more secular. We're living in a world more and more where more and more people are speaking up and saying the idea of an all-powerful God uh, that we are dependent on in our lives, the idea of that, its time has come and gone. We have moved beyond that. We are intelligent. We are advanced. We are not superstitious. There's no boogeyman. We don't need any of that stuff anymore. Uh, we, man is, is the culmination of this naturalistic creation, and that's all that matters, and we don't need belief in a God to have a successful life. Is that true? Are the atheists right? Or are there actually tangible arguments to consider for the existence of God? Now, let me say this, all right, right at the outset. You cannot definitively prove the existence of God. Okay? You can't prove to everyone's satisfaction the existence of God. Just as you cannot disprove the existence of God. What you can do is examine whatever evidences that are available to you and draw a conclusion from those evidences as to what the evidence best supports. Okay? Y'all with me so far? Come on. I know this is different, but that's all. You, you, can't, you can't definitively prove him. You can't disprove him. You can only look at the evidence and draw conclusions based on the evidence as to what uh, answer best fits the evidence provided to you. Let me also say this, and then we're going to get into this. Let me also say this. God is not trying to prove himself to anybody. Okay, it's very important that you understand that. God is not trying to prove himself to anybody. Let's face it, for an all-powerful God, that's not a big deal, right? It wouldn't be hard for God to prove himself if if that was all it took. All all he's got to do is just, boom, show up and everybody will believe in it. God is not trying to prove himself to anybody. What God is doing is revealing himself to anybody who would desire to know him and would desire to seek after him. That is what God is doing, and there's a difference there. One allows for faith, one does not, and faith is essential in this relationship with God. God's not trying to prove himself, but God is revealing himself to anybody and everybody, to any and all that would come to him and desire to know him and to follow after him. So the question becomes, is a person open to it? Is a person willing to consider the claims and the arguments for the existence of God and not only consider them, but then consider what the implications of that are for their very existence? Because you may have noticed the elements of the Lord's Supper Uh, down front here this morning. They are here uh, for part of the service later on, but they are here for those who not only believe in the existence of God, but for those who have committed their lives to that very God and are desiring to follow after Him. So that becomes the question. Because listen, when all is said and done, the existence of God is not the big deal as you'll see over the next few weeks, the arguments for the existence of God are both rational and essential for us understanding our lives. God's existence, the the evidence for the existence of God is not the big deal. The big deal is that this God would love us and love us enough to be willing to die for us. That's the big deal. And that's what this is about today. But before we get there, we've got to go through a couple of arguments. And before we get into the first one, I think y'all need a little Pastor Jim again. I think y'all need a little more Pastor Jim. 
All right, Pastor Jim, then we'll get into it. But I'm not interested in recreating the prostitute of the church. Amen. Amen. You remember when I came here, Kelly? You remember where your wife was, where your sisters were? Do you remember where they were? And we made holy war. Do you remember that? Stay with me. Don't quit me. Oh, Brandy. Oh, Brandy's a sweet girl, and she's got her children. Yes, y'all are good, and y'all are fine, but your children will turn on you if you don't hold up the standard and the banner of God. And if they don't turn on you, they'll just, you'll just produce nice little whirlians. That's inspirational. <laughs> okay, here we go. That's enough, Pastor Jim. Y'all are, now y'all are back, y'all are zoned, y'all ready? Let's start with what is known as the, y'all ready? The ontological argument for the existence of God. The ontological, why don't, that's such a fun word to say. Why don't y'all say that? The ontological argument for the existence of God. I want to read a passage of scripture to you that speaks uh, to that uh, idea and then we'll hopefully get into what the argument says. In Deuteronomy chapter 32, um, it says, I will announce the name of the Lord. Praise God because he is great. He is like a rock. What he does is perfect and he is always fair. He is a faithful God who does no wrong, who is right and fair. The ontological argument. Uh, the word ontological obviously is based on, comes out the Greek word onta, which means being or that which is. So this is the argument of his being or the argument uh, that is. The ontological argument, I will go ahead and tell you this, is probably the most uh, difficult to grasp and to understand. And the reason is because it is not based on any um, tangible, empirical evidence. Okay? It is an argument purely from reason, from intellect. It is what's known as an a priori or a priori argument, an argument purely from reason and not based on evidence. You still with me? It's early. Okay. So, the ontological argument is an argument of reason. Uh, It was developed by an 11th century theologian by the name of Anselm. Anselm developed this theory, as I said, that it's based on reason. And because it is based on reason, I'll just be honest with you, it's not my favorite argument for the existence of God. It's not. But I do believe that there is something to this argument that is at least worth calling to your attention so that you... Uh, can blow somebody away at the office one day when they say they don't believe in God. And I say, well, have you considered the ontological argument? Okay, the ontological argument, um, as I said, is based on reason. And, and, and hang with me here. It's going to seem like I'm kind of going around to get to this um, conclusion, but I have my, my reasons for that. There are certain things that we uh, know are not true And we know them purely by definition. In other words, we don't necessarily need evidence to know that that a certain something uh, is not true. Okay? I'll give you an example. I'm I'm pulling these examples. These particular two examples are coming from the website. uh, I think it's beliefingod.com. I think it's the name of it. But let me give you a a couple of, of these obvious untrue statements. The statement... The claim to have made a four-sided triangle and the claim to be over six feet tall but less than five feet tall are obviously untrue. Why? Because by definition, a triangle has how many sides? Three. No more, no less. And by definition, a person who is six feet tall is automatically more than five feet tall. So it is obviously apparent that those two statements are false and you don't need any evidence to support that, right? You don't need to go out looking for four-sided triangles. You don't need to go out looking for tall, short people to know that both of these statements are inaccurate, that they are false because by definition, it is clear that they are untrue, right? You with me? 
Well, the ontological argument proposes that the claim that God doesn't exist is just as ludicrous as the claim that a four-sided triangle does exist. And the reason that Anselm gave is because the definition, by definition, who God is reveals that, that the idea that he doesn't exist is ludicrous, just like the definition of a triangle have, and saying that it has four sides is ludicrous because, by definition, it has three sides. Okay? So, um, I'm going to try and walk you through this ontological argument and, and giving it to you like in just the way I broke it down into like smaller bites uh, or steps. And so in the next few moments as we're going through this, if you find yourself at some point, like I said, you know, checking out or dozing off or, or feeling completely lost, it's not your fault, okay? Uh, and hopefully it's not my fault either. This is just a, an idea that has to be kind of chewed on, all right? It's okay to be, it's okay to think. I know more and more our culture doesn't want us to think about anything, but it's okay to think. All right? Y'all all right with that? Y'all with me? Okay. So let me give you some, some of the s- small bites of this. So let, let's start with the ontological argument. Here we go. Step one. Uh, oh, well, yeah. I, I guess I better start with the definition of, of God. God, one of the aspects, there's a lot of things that would be necessary for a person to be considered God. And I'm referring to the God revealed in Scripture. But one of the things that God is, by definition, is all powerful. To call something God that isn't all powerful would be like calling a, four, uh, a four-sided triangle a triangle. It, it wouldn't make sense. It, it makes no sense. God is all powerful. God is also, in the scripture uh, we know, for, certainly from scripture, is that God is perfect, right? And it is this idea of perfection that is the key to understanding the ontological argument. You with me? What's the key to understanding the ontological argument? Perfection. Keep that in mind. Perfection. So, the definition of God, according to Merriam-Webster, is this. The supreme or ultimate reality, the being perfect in power, wisdom, and goodness, who is worshipped as creator and ruler of the universe. Okay? I'd say that's a pretty solid biblical uh, understanding of who God is. He is perfect in all respects. All right, so now let's get into the steps or the bites that you can chew on. Ready? Step one. Here we go. Something can't properly be called God unless it is perfect, right? Because by definition, God is perfect. Okay? Right? So you can't properly call uh, something or someone God if they are less than perfect because by definition, God is perfect. Step two. If something is perfect, then it can't possibly be better than it is. Would you agree with that? There, in other words, there aren't varying degrees of perfection. Something is either perfect or it is not perfect. Either it can be improved upon or it can't be improved upon. If it can't be improved upon, it is perfect in every single way. Step three. It is impossible then to conceive of there being anything greater than God... Right? I think we can get that. Or of it being possible to imagine God being better or greater than he already is. Right? Would you agree with that? Why? Because he's perfect. And by definition, something that is perfect cannot be improved upon. It cannot be better. It is perfect. Right? No, no evidence. We're just, we're just, we're just reasoning this. This is what Amstelm's doing. He's walking us through this, this regional read. Reasonable argument for the existence of God. So, now watch this. Step four. Here's where, here's where this thing hopefully begins to come into focus. This argument. If we were to think of God as not existing. I, I don't think God exists. If we were to think of God as not existing. Then we would also be able to imagine him being better than he is. Right? Right? If God doesn't exist, then God could be better than he is because a God who exists is better than a God that doesn't exist. Right? Ah, I might be seeing some light bulbs come on here. Anselm would be proud. 
So step five, to think of God as not existing then, is to think of God as being imperfect because a God that doesn't exist could be better than he is. But problem, step six, the idea that God doesn't exist implies his imperfection. Therefore, the idea that God doesn't exist is just as absurd as, just as obviously false as the idea that a four-sided triangle does exist. Why? Because by definition, God is perfect. God is perfect. By definition, he must be perfect in order to be God. But if God does not exist, then he is less than perfect. Therefore, God must exist. Therefore, step seven, God's non-existence is therefore impossible. That is Anselm's argument. What time is it? Okay. I know, I know that's a lot to take in, and I've, I've rushed through it, and I've given you kind of Cliff Notes version of it, but I hope you can at least get some concept of what Anselm was saying. Listen, this, is, this argument that was presented in the 11th century uh, has been debated and discussed and thrown around for centuries and centuries. This is no small thing. And there are many, uh, or a a good number of philosophers today who, who believe very strongly in this argument. They say, no, this, this is absolutely has credence to it. It's impossible for God to not exist since, by definition, God is perfect and a non-existing God would be less than perfect. That's the essence of what Anselm was saying. Y'all, this, this, I, I grew up on a dairy, so y'all may not get this, but y'all are looking at me like a calf looks at a new gate that y'all are like, what? I don't want. Okay. Y- y'all need some more Pastor Jim. I'm just going to tell you that right now. Here's a little more Pastor Jim, then we'll get into the next argument. Amen. Are y'all keeping the camera on me back there in the little video room? Good. We're having trouble in the video room. There's no one finer than young Cox back there. And he comes down here and spends hours in that thing. But he has a little attitude adjustment that we're going to fix. Brother Cox, you listening? Because, Brother Cox, I can fix your attitude adjustment. And I don't care what your mama thinks and your daddy thinks. And I don't have a better friend than your mama. But, Mama, you get out of my way when I'm messing with that boy because I'm his preacher. I'm, I'm yours when I'm talking to you. But I'm his when I'm talking to him. And last I checked, he's a grown man. And that video room ain't going to be a youth hangout. We might as well just fix this thing. And I don't know what I'm doing wrong. Well, if you don't know what you're doing wrong, son, you don't care about what I want to do right. Because if you loved me and you submitted to me, you'd know what my heart is and my message is, and you wouldn't go about establishing your own kingdom in the video room. I really feel good now. That, uh, that section was for uh, Scott and Tyler and everybody in the AV area. So back there building their own little kingdom. Not going to have the youth hanging out in the video room. The youth, it's always the youth's fault. <laughs> you know what, I'd lo- I don't know. This is, uh, the only sermon I've ever seen from this guy. So is that like a normal Sunday? Or is he just, he's just been building this up for like 10 years and he just unloads? Uh, on everybody at one time. I don't, I don't know. Brother. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Man, it's so bad when they have the control back there. All right, here we go. Here we go. Let, let's look at the second argument I want to tr- briefly run through this morning uh, before we, we just commemorate what God has done for us today. We'll tie these together. Uh, it is what is known as the cosmological argument. Looked at the ontological argument. Uh, arguably, that's the most difficult to grasp. I think this one is a little easier to grasp. Hopefully, it is. 
um, and it is built more on uh, tangible empirical evidence. It is what's called the cosmological argument. I want to read to you uh, from John chapter 1, verse 3. All things came into being through him, and apart from him nothing came into being that has come into being. All things came into existence through him. And nothing that has come into existence has come into existence apart from him. That, in essence, is the cosmological argument. Uh, the cosmological argument. And there, and there, have been, there are different strains of it, and, and the ontological argument for, for that matter. There are different strains and, and veins of it. But the ontological argument basically says that God is real based on observations that things we see around us never exist and could not exist unless something else makes them exist. In other words, the cosmological argument basically says is that everything exists in, I think the, the way they put it was a, uh, uh, it's what's called the first cause argument. It's the other, another name that's sometimes given to this, the first cause argument, that God is the first cause. Uh, everything that exists in the universe is part of a causal, uh, co- has a causal connection. It has uh, this, this li- that everything is linked together in this ultimate complexity throughout the entire universe. That uh, that uh, Emery and Ellie uh, came into being because uh, Travis and Lauren came into being, and, and Travis and Lauren came into being because uh, Cindy and I came into being, and, and our parents, and so on and so forth. You understand? It's this causal that everything in some way is connected. Everything, nothing that we know of in the universe. Uh, is independent of itself and or came into existence without some type of causal connection. Okay? Okay? <coughs> Excuse me. Everything has some type of causal connection to it. So the, the cosmological argument basically posits that God is the reason for that. God is that first cause. Uh, again, this, this is an old argument. This is a really old argument. Really, uh, it was kind of first, even before him, but to some extent it was, it was more fully developed by Aristotle in the 3rd or 4th century before Christ, and then it was fully developed by a theologian by the name of uh, Aquinas, Thomas Aquinas, in the 13th century. And from Aquinas' uh, Summa, let me, let me just read the, the, what he says. It says, We see things in the world that can exist and can also not exist. Now, everything that can exist has a cause. But one cannot go on infinitum in causes. Therefore, one must posit something, the existing of which is necessary. I may be oversimplifying, but what Aquinas is saying is that uh, everything that you see around us, every person, every bush, every every everything has some connection to something prior to it. It in some way is connected. But Aquinas argued that chain of causation can't, does not go off into infinity. In other words, it can't go on forever. It did, it, there, there had to be a starting point. There had to be a first, say it, cause. That it does not go on infinitum, forever and forever and forever into the, the distance. Uh, by the way, secular science has confirmed this very idea that the vast majority of secular scientists agree with the idea that the universe had a beginning. For a long time, that was uncertain, that was un- unclear, but Edwin Hubble in 1925 pretty substantially showed that the universe is expanding, and if the universe is expanding, that must mean that it had to have had a starting point at some point. There had to be a starting point for the universe. That is the cosmological argument. There has to be a first cause. And Aquinas argued that God is that first cause. Okay, probably the, the, the clearest uh, analogy that has been used uh, for the cosmological argument is a train. Think of a, of a boxcar line of trains. Imagine that you are somewhere, you're somewhere out there in those woods and you hear some noise and you, and you come down out of your little cave and you look there and you see this boxcar in front of you and this boxcar is moving and your first uh, thought is well, how, how is this box car moving? And then as you look at it, you realize that that box car is is being pulled by the box car in front of it, right? And it's being pulled by the box car in front of it, and it's being pulled by the box car in front of it, right on out of sight. 
But you could take that entire line of boxcars and you could hook them up all the way around the entire earth and bring them back together, but you still would not have a reason for the movement of that first boxcar that you saw. There must be somewhere in that train a locomotive. There has to be a cause. There has to be something that's pulling the train. You understand? That's that's the cosmological argument. Now take that and apply it to everything that you know in the universe around you. Everything that you know has some type of cause, not only for coming into existence, but for its very to stay, to have existence. It's connected to something else. That's the cosmological argument. Now, uh, I did, real quickly, I did have three um, arguments that are given against it. Uh, just so you could look at them, it's no big deal. I'm going I'm to skip over the first two. They're, they're, I mean, I can deal, tell you about them, but they're easy to answer. But just to give you the third one, because this one seems to me come up a good bit. The third argument w- was this. If everything has a cause and God caused everything, then who or what caused God? Have you ever had anybody say that to you? Oh, well, who caused God then? Right? Who caused God? The simplest answer to that is simply uh, to say this. Causation applies only to those things created. It would only apply to those things created, only to those things natural. And since, by definition, God is supernatural, God would be outside of those causal limitations. What was that name God gave for himself? I am. The self-existing one. I had no beginning. I have no end. I have no cause. I am the cause. John chapter 1. Of all that is, that is the cosmological argument. Now, Aquinas obviously realized that this, the building this case for the existence of God was important, but not only to, to understanding and, and reason and even to religion, but to life itself, ladies and gentlemen, because life itself makes no sense. This, this, is, this is what this comes down to. Life itself makes no sense apart from the existence of God. It really doesn't. And I promise you that you can try your entire existence to to find meaning, to find purpose, to try and find whatever in whatever you can, but it will never be enough. It will never satisfy. It will never bring contentment into your life. I saw this as a gym the other day, and I saw this uh, sign that's behind this guy's head who was, Uh, talking, was giving this interview, I saw the sign, and the sign said this, I feel like life is soup and I'm a fork. Get it? Do you know, do you know what you understand what he's saying? Man, I I can't, I can't get it. I keep trying, but I can't get it. That's exactly what God said to us at the very beginning. You can try all you want, you can achieve as much as you want, you can do whatever you want, but I'm telling you right now, it will never be enough. You'll always be hungry for more, you'll always be frustrated, like trying to eat soup with a fork, you'll always be aggravated, you'll never be contented. Never. It's only in a relationship with the living God. I said at the beginning of this thing, that the big deal is not that that God is. The big deal is that God does. God does love us. That this God that we're discussing, and we'll look at more in the coming weeks, but this God, this this creator, this first cause, this, this God would choose to love us. When we absolutely had no hope of, of ever having that, when we had no reason to hope, and when we had did not deserve to hope because we were hopelessly lost in our sinfulness and had no expectation that anything could change in our lives at all, period, except for one unexplainable, tremendous truth. Romans 5 eight. but God demonstrated his own love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Ontological, okay. Cosmological, all right. Sacrificial, that's what, that's what this is. 
As we learned from these two arguments today, thinking men have been thinking about and discussing the reality of God for a long time. Next week, we're going to look at a few more of the arguments for God's existence. Hopefully, each of us is discovering that our faith in God is solid and sensible. The real mystery is that the great I Am would choose to love us enough to die for us so that we could live in Him. We invite you to join us on a Sunday morning at Cross Culture Church. We gather each week in a casual and contemporary atmosphere and celebrate the goodness of our God. Cross culture may be a little different from what you're thinking. Sure, we're a church, but instead of religion, we're about relationships. A community of believers where Jesus is revealed in the lives of each person. Real people who truly care. Solid biblical teaching from Pastor Clay Stevens. And the most energetic, safe, and fun kids program around. Find out more at crossculturelife.org. I want you to the cross. Cross Culture Church in North Raleigh, taking the cross to our culture and taking our culture to the cross.